which one? Hello, 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 everyone out in SVP land and now in RAO land. Um, we, we're, we're glad to have with us today our um, first uh, pre-conference uh, session, uh, informational session given to us by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And I am uh, Willie Rockward, uh, conference chair, or conference PI, past president of NSVP. But hey, that's not important. What's most important is we wanna hear things about NRA, NRAO. So at this moment, I would like to turn over to our moderator for today, um, uh, Lindell Von Schell. Lindell, all yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Rockward. Uh, we are so thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm gonna just give a brief overview of what we're planning to do. Um, during this session, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to our first uh, presenter. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about NRAO, about uh, career opportunities at NRAO, and then an overview of three of our, um, uh, well, four of our programs uh, that are very important to us um, that really are focused on um, serving underrepresented minority students uh, in STEM. Uh, and so we're going to start with, um, with Faye Giles, who is the director of NRAO's uh, Human Resources Department. Uh, then we'll uh, move into Anya Fori, who will talk about our programs. And then we're going to have um, some special presentations from three of our students who have been through the program, alums of our program, um, Azia Robinson, Kenneth Hopes, and Aaliyah Wolford. Um, and so I'm going to turn this over to Faye. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lindell. Yes, I am Faye Giles and I am the Director of Human Resources and we are really excited to participate in this great conference and we've been partners with the NSBP for many years. But here at AUI, NREO and GBO, it is our mission to enable world-class science with cutting edge radio facilities for the scientific community. We are really striving to train the next generation of scientists and engineers and to foster a scientific literal, literate society. But additionally, to recognize all the great work that we've been doing around diversity, equity, and inclusion, we want to say that we are truly committed to advancing broader, equitable, inclusive participation in science and engineering. <clears throat> in order to achieve our overall missions, we really, really need to have great team members. And we're excited to announce that we currently have over 37 career opportunities available. These vacancies are in the areas of scientific positions, postdoctoral fellows, administrative, computer hardware and software, crafts and trades, engineering, uh, engineers, technicians, management, education, and public outreach and also brought in participation. Our work locations include Charlottesville, which is headquartered on the grounds of the University of Virginia. We also have a great uh, central development lab and the North American ARMA Science Center is also located in Charlottesville on the grounds of UVA. We have the largest sterile telescope in the world in Green Bank, West Virginia. And we have our largest work population located in New Mexico. We have an office um, in, in Socorro and in Albuquerque. And we have the amazing site at the very large uh, array. Uh, we also have exciting uh, international partnerships. And we have Chile located in, uh, we have staff located in Chile. So we are committed to a diverse and inclusive workplace culture that accepts and appreciates all individuals from varying backgrounds and experience. We have excellent benefits that include vacation leave, sick leave, 13 paid holidays. We have a 10% employer paid retirement contribution. We have 10%. an employer contribution, I'm sorry. Wow. Sorry. 10%, yes. After six months of employment, you get 10% of an employer retirement contribution so you can start saving six months after you get here. Yeah, and 13 paid holidays and we're adding Juneteenth this year for 2022. Uh, we also have an employer contribution to our health, to your health savings account. We have paid parental leave and many of these positions are eligible for telework and remote work arrangements. So 
We have an incredible Office of Diversity and Inclusion, as well as a rigorous broadening participation program. And we also offer professional development funding, as well as tuition re reimbursement. So we want you to stop by our booth, booth number three, and also help us spread the word that we are hiring. We are looking for diverse candidates and we really appreciate anybody you can send our way. Uh, in addition to our many career opportunities, we also have some great student and postdoctoral fellowships. Um, you can find our job postings at careers.nrao.edu. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Lindell unless you all have questions. Thank you. So if you do have questions at any point, just feel free to raise your hand. Uh, in the meantime, I did put the link to our job uh, openings uh, in the chat, uh, if you'd like to find that. Uh, and so now I'm going to turn this over to, uh, thank you, Faye, that was wonderful. <laughs> I always love hearing about the great things that we offer at NREO, it's so it's really good. Yeah, we rock, um, we rock. We do rock, we rock. Um, so I'm just going to turn this over to Anya Farina, who runs our broadening participation programs and uh, can talk a little bit more about um, our programs. Thank you very much, Lindell. And um, as an employee of the NRAO, I just want to say that I moved halfway across the world to work for this institution. And really the one thing that attracted me to the NRAO was the vision of this organization and the vision of its leadership. Um, it really is Whenever we interview, people ask us, what is it that attracted you to NRAO? And that's one of the main things. So I really do love working here and we do have great benefits. So just to give you a very quick overview of our student programs, um, really because I want the students to do the talking, you know, and give you an idea of their real experiences. And I think what I want to start with is, you know, something very important that Faye said, and that is, you know, when we talk about astronomy at the NRAO or, um, you know, the different fields that we're looking for, you know, a diverse, diverse workforce, people seem to have a very narrow idea of what astronomy is, but we want to make sure that you know that astronomy crosses with so many different fields and that we really are looking not only for a diverse workforce, but one, you know, that is multifaceted and really works across different fields of science. So if you see a field within this uh, diagram that's on the screen now that you work in, the chances are very good that we're going to need, you know, your skills in the future um, and that we're probably already looking for those skills. So I think the very important thing about our programs is that they are student informed um, and, you know, increasingly there are being student led. So, you know, what we like to do is to really listen to our students. Um, you know, this is just a diagram from our project radial meeting where we had a needs analysis with students to really hear about, well, you know, what are the barriers and what is it that they need specifically for the radial program? Um, it has taken, you know, a number of years, but I can honestly say, I think NRAO is one of the leading institutions when it comes to really sitting down with its students, listening to what they need um, you know, and as I say, as we develop these cohorts through the years, having our students lead the programs because they know better than anybody else what it is um, that students need. So I'm going to just highlight for you probably two of the main programs. Um, also, the programs that have been running the longest and, you know, through which we've developed the best practices um, of our broadening participation programs. And the oldest and probably, you know, the one that's had the most impact is the National Astronomy Consortium program. That really is innovative. It's a competitive program. And, you know, it's designed to not only provide research opportunities over the summer, but increasingly throughout the year, but to establish a long-term mentoring relationship between students and their mentors, often more than one mentor. And what we really want this program to do is to build a strong national cohort of students, you know, who will go forward together and who will support one another um, and become the next workforce within the United States and even abroad. So as part of that program, yes, we provide the research experience, um, but not only at the NRAO, we also have partner states, uh, partner sites at Michigan State, Princeton University, and Wisconsin Madison. Um, and within all our programs, uh, students will receive a stipend with travel assistant. It, assistance if moving to you know one of the sites 
Um, as I said, long-term research mentoring, we really believe in providing academic and professional development. So if students identify that perhaps they'd like science communication training or they'd like project management training, we try as far as possible to work with the individual students to be able to do that for them. Um, we have weekly cohort meetings during the summer where these cohorts get together and you know, we let them run those meetings as well because that peer mentoring and support is so important. Um, and we want these cohorts to continue you know, after they leave the NRA or the partner sites. Um, you know, throughout the, the, rest of the, the rest of the year, we have year round virtual hangouts, which are again, student run, you know, just to ensure that these cohorts stay together. And then what we also like to do is have our students participating, you know, firstly in, uh, you know, what we used to call the NAC workshop, which is held in DC. Now, because we, we've gone virtual, it's called NACtober. And in fact, Aliyah is, you know, one of the chairs of that month long conference for the NACs. Um, but we also like to encourage membership in professional societies and paying for that. So whether it be the NSBP, for example, or the AAS or the NSBE. And then we like our students to show off their research and show off what they've done, um, especially at the American Astronomical Society winter meeting. So that really gives you an idea of, you know, what one of our programs encompasses. Um, we've had, you know, great success in terms of students who remain within these cohorts, um, you know, and have gone on to graduate school, but not only that, are now, you know, graduating with their PhDs in astronomy or related fields. So it's really wonderful to see that cohort grow. And I look forward to these students one day being my boss, you know, we really, that's what we want. So this is just a quick graphic to give you, you know, this pathway, um, you know, of exactly what the NAC experience is. You can have a look at this on our website. And eventually what we'd like to see is that pathway coming back and having our students, you know, um, coming back to teach others and becoming, you know, our, our faculty or our staff and mentoring the next generation. Um, so this is just, as I said, we like to listen to our students and we like to do evaluation after each of the programs to really find out what is it about NAC that works? What is it that doesn't work? How do we improve, um, you know, and how do we continue to support that cohort as they grow? So one of the other programs we have is the National and International Non-Traditional Exchange, otherwise known as NINE. Um, and this is a program of a different kind, but again, you know, has established best practice that, that we like to bring in. This is an intense summer uh, program. The difference is that it's very practical. So students have a technical mentor or, you know, or a science and technology mentor, as well as a project management mentor, which is me. Um, and so during the summer, students not only learn that, you know, technical skill in which we would like to train them up, but they also get to learn project management. Um, and as they go through the summer, we like to get them to help us develop, uh, you know, training material so that we can train others or they can go forth and train others in that particular skill. Um, what we do require is, you know, that the person who comes to us as nine or the participant is willing with their home institution to establish a nine hub at their institution so that they can go back to their institution and train others in the skills that they've developed through this hub. Um, and also, you know, very importantly, to work with the other hubs that we have established around the world to be able to train students or, you know, young professionals in those hubs. So, you know, you have similar, you will have sim similar, you know, um, benefits, you know, or uh, receive similar perks, as they say, during the summer um, training experience. But I think the, you know, the, the one additional thing is that we do like to mentor students, um, you know, to get ready for the certified associate and project management exam. We will cover the textbook and the exam fees, do the mentoring, and students are then able to write the exam and walk away with, you know, a very sought after um, you know, project management certification. And then, as I said, also looking at memberships and professional societies, um, and also, you know, talking about what they've learned at the AAS meeting. So this is currently where we have hubs around the world. Um, our focus for the next year will be 
amongst others, Puerto Rico. But, you know, if you are interested in taking part in the NINE program, give us a shout out and, you know, we'll take it from there. Our newest project is the Radio Astronomy Data Imaging and Analysis Lab. We have a big data problem at the NRA, as many observatories do. And what we realized is that there really is no one better when it comes, you know, to training up a diverse workforce than minority serving institutions in the United States and abroad. So Radial is an alliance um, that consists of the NRAO as well as 14 minority serving institutions. Um, and Willie, you know, um, Morgan, uh, Morgan State is one of those universities. You may recognize your own university in that group on the slide. And what we do is, you know, essentially using our big data problem and astronomy, uh, you know, high throughput computing to train students in the field because we know we're going to need, um, you know, this just really innovative way workforce 10 to 15 years from now. Um, so the idea is that all these institutions work together um, and students are also able to do summer programs you know, at the different institutions. Um, we started that, as Zia will tell you a little bit later, working with one of our partner institutions, Wisconsin Madison. Um, but really the idea is that, you know, there will be this collaborative effort and that students can, you know, do internships at the other institutions over the summer with similar benefits um, and perks and support as well. Uh, then the second last project is, as I said, we look at many different uh, areas and Spectrum X or National Radio Dynamic Zone. We've, uh, the spectrum, the radio spectrum is very important um, to radio astronomy. And so this is another one of the summer programs that we'll be offering over the next five years is to work with, again, one of 14 research institutions in the United States to work specifically on spectrum physics, engineering, you know, radio astronomy, you know, how we use the spectrum, doing radio frequency interference, um, you know, monitoring the spectrum, all sorts of aspects, you know, anything that touches the edges or the, the actual radio um, spectrum. At the moment we're looking at, you know, just how much interference there is, for example, from SpaceX satellites on radio astronomy. So this is really a very rapidly developing field um, where the United States wants to be a leader. And so if Spectrum is something that you're interested in, you know, there are opportunities for summer programs with Spectrum X and the NRAO as well. And then finally coming up, you know, in 10 or 15 years from now, the NRAO will be building what's called the next generation, very large array, which will consist of about 240 dishes um, around the continental US, all the way also from Hawaii down to the Virgin Islands. It will be the next big mega science project. Um, and, you know, we cannot start getting ready early enough, uh, you know, for, you know, for this workforce that we're going to need to run this project. Um, I've just come from South Africa where we did, you know, the SKA project. And really we should have started five years earlier getting our workforce ready. So we are also now offering summer programs related to the next generation uh, VLA. And again, anything you can imagine, whether it's education, whether it's anthropology, whether it's archeology, span whether it's architecture, design of these, um, you know, of these telescopes, electronics, you know, any field of physics you can probably think of we're going to need. Um, so that's a very quick overview of those five different projects. We have more in the pipeline, but you know these are the opportunities available right now. Thanks, Lindell. Thank you very much, Anya. Um, so now, uh, as Anya promised, uh, we're going to have um, a presentation by Azia Robinson, who did um, some summer research um, this past summer in the radial project. Uh, but Azia is also a NAC alum, so I'm sure she'll talk a little bit about both of those things. Welcome, Azia. It's good to see you again. <laughs> good to see you again as well. Um, is everyone able to see this presentation? Great. All right. Hi. Like Lindo said with this very nice introduction, I'm Azia Robinson. Currently, I'm a post -back research student at uh, Princeton University. And I want to tell you a little bit about my experience in the NAC as well as in 
the radio project. So starting off with a little bit about myself, I graduated this past spring from Agnes Scott College of Radio um, Partner School with my bachelor's of science in astrophysics and a minor in political science. I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia. So going to Agnes, I was right at home, indicator. Um, it's right outside of Atlanta. And Agnes has a wonderful astrophysics program um, pictured here. Um, there's me in the center with a, a fellow student off to the left of me in the picture. And the right is um, our professor, Amy Lovell. Um, and through Agnes, I was able to um, meet a lot of people affiliated with NREO. Um, my academic advisor, Chris Dupree, he really pushed me to start working with NREO and, um, and like join the NAC program. So um, let me see. Um, currently, I am working uh, at Princeton, I said this, and this opportunity came about through my, um, through my affiliation with NAC. I was able to um, meet um, Professor Jenny Green. Princeton is also a um, school that's affiliated with NAC, and you're able to do research there. The project that I'm working on is imaging H1 in the, dwarf, in the dwarf galaxy. And all of this, my, um, my background, of course, is radio astronomy. And I got this through my training um, during the summer programs with the NAC, as well as um, my advisor's um, project, working with him on radio data. So uh, my strengths were really pushed forward during um, my experience in NAC and radial in um, data analysis and imaging, um, radio data, VLA data. Um, in the NAC and in radial, I really got more comfortable with public speaking and my area of expertise, as I will call it, is um, working in CASA. That's the um, common astronomical software applications. It's really, um, the radio astronomers toolkit. Um, that's how we image data. That's how we analyze it. And um, as they were saying before, there's a lot of data and people need to be able to um, analyze it and work with it. And no one's better than the folks who are trained by the folk, by the people in NAC and with radio. And um, I also learned that research is extremely re rewarding and fun, but it does come with, um, as you could probably imagine, the uh, tiring parts. Um, you're trying and trying again, and you sometimes don't know where you're supposed to go, but that's um, where some of the benefits of being in NAC and radial come in. There's this wonderful community that you foster um, being in NAC. Um, pictured here are some of my friends um, who are NAC alums and radio students. Um, and we all actually like get to meet up and like enjoy each other. So um, being a part of NAC and radio, you do make these relationships and you do become part of a community that is willing and able and ready to support you. And you really feel sometimes through your journey um, going through undergrad um, that you might be alone in this and that maybe things are like really tough and you might not be able to get through it. But um, NAC was able to help me see that even though things are really hard, I am prepared and they helped prepare me through this and they helped with facilitating the idea that I, I do belong in this space and I do belong in research and working in data and being an astronomer. Um, thank you. That's um, what I had to say. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Thank you, Azia. Uh, I will keep an eye out for questions if anyone has a, a raised hand. Um, 
Um, it was really fantastic, Zia. It's just been really um, wonderful to to have you in the in these programs. You know, I'm just really looking forward to watching your career. <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. So thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> um, and next, I'd like to introduce um, Kenneth Hopes, um, who worked on the um, NRDZ, National Radio Dynamic Zone, um, doing some summer research. Um, and so, Kenneth, um, take it away. Okay. Let me just. Hi, my name is Kenneth Hopes, and I was a participant in the NRL research and training experience. And um, I'm from a little bit about, my, about, my, about myself is I'm currently at a, a sophomore at the University of Texas at San Antonio. I'm majoring in computer science. Uh, I've also gathered uh, right now, what I'm doing right now is I'm working, you know, entry level IT support help desk sort of because, you know, I need us, you know, support my income, but also like I needed a skill and um, like a thing to get me by. So I've also been certified in the CompTIA Network Plus and the A Plus. So what that is, is the A Plus is just troubleshooting like computer hardware and then Network Plus is tr troubleshooting, you know, networking on uh, standard uh, PCs. And the way the NRL uh, found me or I, I got in contact with the NRL was through Coder Dojo Collaborative. So Coder Dojo is basically just um, an organization where I was a mentor and I taught kids ages seven through about 17, uh, the methodology of Raspberry Pi, how to use it, how to incorporate different electronics on it. So like blinking the LEDs or um, maybe creating a web server and stuff. And that's where after doing about two years of that, that's where um, I met um, Anya and the NRL. So this research program was about six weeks. It was a six week internship. And I was tasked with developing uh, or actually incorporating the software defined radio on the Raspberry Pi and then created like a little guidebook for uh, for uh, grades ages 10 to 12 for educators and students. And so I guess the reason was uh, for the Raspberry Pi is the Raspberry Pi is not like a standard computer that you actually have. There's, the Raspberry Pi is just this little uh, right here. You see this green credit card microcomputer right there that can be very, if you have internet access and a keyboard and mouse and a monitor, then you can easily set up in uh, poor and displaced areas. So you can, uh, in those areas, you can uh, uh, do a method of radial astronomy on the Raspberry Pi. And throughout the six weeks, I did a lot of things. I did seven weeks of uh, SDR projects, uh, like NOAA satellite tracking, aircraft tracking, um, maybe setting up a server, or from one location to another and listening on other people's frequencies. Um, but to simplify it, uh, I did a little step-by-step step one to five um, process of what I did. So first I learned the software defined radio. I was thankful that the NRL provided me all these materials you see at the bottom, the hobbyist guidebook for the RTLCR. That's what I learned. I read that first um, and I got uh, you know familiar with, oh, what is uh, software defined radio? What is this antenna? What am I supposed to do with it? Um, they, that, so I read that. And then the NRL gave me the Raspberry Pi 4. Now the Raspberry Pi 4, it's, the, it's a model that has four gigabytes of RAM inside the little micro, it's a micro computer right there. Um, and then they gave me the two antennas right here, uh, the standard uh, RTSDR uh, uh, antenna for, I can just put it in the USB hubs uh, inside the uh, Raspberry Pi. And then I got, uh, I realized since the Raspberry Pi uses Linux, uh, I had to review my Linux, you know, file administration. So I spent about maybe, I guess, two days reading and reviewing uh, all about Linux, like everything, I, like everything in depth. And then throughout the rest of the weeks, I did the SDR project. And yes, what I did was I um, opened the Raspberry Pi and I set up the antenna and everything on it. And I, uh, I did a number of projects. I, the first project I was, supposed to do, I was supposed to be doing was the aircraft tracking, but I, I realized that that would have been over in like, 
in like a week. So I just had, I decided to, okay, I'll do seven projects uh, from the book and then document my results, document how the commands, how what commands to put into it and how to um, get it to work on the Raspberry Pi. And then I create a guidebook using Adobe InDesign, which I'll show later on. So here's an example of one of the projects I did. Uh, I was the tracking the aircraft on the Raspberry Pi. So I used a software called Dump 1090, which was a, uh, a capture the package that the aircraft, it's, it's called automatic dependence of and broadcast uh, that the aircraft use to determine other aircraft positions. So I was able to use that, incorporate the antenna on the Raspberry Pi, and then the antenna will just capture the packets. And I, and then I use the virtual radar server. So virtual radar server is a map you see right here where I open a new tab and I open like a little testing, a testing ground on the Raspberry Pi desktop. This is the desktop right here, or the, um, it's on Chrome. So I open virtual radar server and I put those packets and just display the map of all the little aircrafts. I'm not sure if you can see it, but you can see the tiny little planes right here and around me and the information, the altitude, and um, also the speed and which it's going at. And right here in the, on the right, you see the packets that I'm getting on the terminal. So then um, I did a lot of projects. I, I won't have time to explain all of them, but I will be able to explain that the Adobe InDesign. Uh, so this is uh, one of the, I guess this is like a snippet of the document I did. The document is over like uh, maybe a hundred pages worth of just uh, like how to install this in a terminal, how to um, configure this, how to install maybe virtual radar server right here. Um, so I use Adobe InDesign to basically capture the images that I, I, I that I did on the Raspberry Pi, paste them on there, and then the my method my methodology I uh, documented the commands that you need to use. And so the things that I learned from this was uh, Linux, of course you have. So the Raspberry Pi uses Linux, so you need to have a basic understanding of you know Linux file administration. So I, I recommend that since anyone can do this, you'd pretty much need to understand, I guess a little basic understanding of Linux. So I would recommend reading just maybe a little Linux book um, or going on linuxacademy.com and just doing some of the exercises, then you'll be ready to um, follow along the instructions I did right here. Of course, the instructions on the guidebook, there are, um, I made it simple for users to understand. So like, uh, like copy and paste the configuration parameters on this empty terminal right here. So you'll be able to see like a visual representation and be able to follow along. Uh, so the Raspberry Pi, there is only four little USB ports that you can stick into it. And there's not a lot of space for that. So you're gonna need maybe a USB hub if you wanna you know, add sensors and modules to it. And lastly, anyone can do this. So no matter, I taught kids using Raspberry Pi ages seven all the way to 17. So there is no limit, you can, uh, there's no limit, anyone can do this. And so my experience throughout this uh, six weeks course was, it was a great introductory to radio astronomy. And I definitely see myself doing this kind of thing um, as I progress towards my career. And I have a new found respect for, you know, the little tiny Raspberry Pi that I had. <laughs> the, it's surprising that that tiny little computer can do all the things that I did. Um, so I'm with, I had a newfound respect of the Raspberry Pi and its, you know, capabilities. And of course, I was forced to be using Linux. So I have, you know, increased my knowledge and practice uh, towards it. And I gained new knowledge of, you know, different, uh, different commands and uh, different ways to ex execute those commands. And I want to show you the exact um, document that I did. So if I go right here. Oops. Okay, so here's a document that I did right here. It's on Drive. Um, if it loads up. There it is. So this is about 100 pages worth of everything related to the Raspberry Pi on the, on the software-defined radio, the dongle. So you can see right here, um, 
I did sort of more, I added some commands for like basic, the basic installation of the, the RTS ER driver, the antenna that I had. And then I did more projects. Like for example, if I go up all the way to uh, the table content right here, um, I did marine tr marine automated detection system. So you can track, uh, I guess, ships in uh, in your area with the Raspberry Pi. If you're ever out and see uh, the NOAA satellite tracker, that's the one that I did where I actually able to capture just what was um, the, I was actually captured like where I was located located using a NOAA satellite. And then I did the RTL over network. So you can connect to different other people's frequencies over the Raspberry Pi to a series of servers. And there was also one called the aircraft communication addressing reporting system, which allows you to uh, capture the reporting systems that aircrafts use to um, like document the weather. So if I just scroll a little bit down, all the way down, just a random spot. Right here. So this is a NOAA satellite. This is what I captured right here all the way down. And I even have, if you don't understand the Linux commands, I even have just like a little um, uh, glossary that explains like what the command does and what you can do. And so that's it. Thank you very much, Kent. That's impressive, very impressive. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for this great work. Uh, I think it's gonna have a lot of impact on um, on students um, uh, in the future. And so uh, thanks for, for doing that, that work. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Um, so next up, I want to introduce um, Aaliyah Wofford. Um, Aaliyah, um, oh my gosh, I don't know where to start here. Um, Aaliyah has been with the NAC program for a number of years, um, has just been um, an incredible um, resource and support for students, uh, for me, for NRAO in general. Um, she knows a lot about the NAC program uh, because she's been there doing a lot of the work. And as Anya mentioned, um, in the last few years, we've really encouraged um, um, the NAC alums to take over the leadership of, of the NAC program in many ways. And um, Aaliyah stepped up very early to do that. She's been on the organizing committee for NACtober, which is the annual um, NAC meeting. Uh, and so I'm just gonna let her tell a little bit more about, um, about what, she, what she does. Thanks, Leah. Hi guys. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. I'm gonna share my screen. And funny enough, I had a slide that I was ready for um, to talk about the NAC and everything, um, but essentially about what the program does. But since Anya and Linda have already done that so well at doing it, I'll just go and skip on to the part about how I got here. <laughs> so um, essentially, I'm originally from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, um, and I was really very interested in astronomy at a very early age. And um, so my idea to get to astronomy was through the physics department. And so when I went to college, I went to Elizabeth City State University out of Elizabeth City, North Carolina. It's a small town off the coast and a small HBCU at that. And I majored in physics. And um, Unfortunately, as I was progressing through the program because of budget cuts with the program, my program was actually phased out. So I was not able to continue as a physics major at Elizabeth City State University. So that sort of, you know, that was somewhat devastating and somewhat life-changing, but I didn't decide to leave Elizabeth City State University immediately. So I decided to switch into biology. And so I decided to do biology and I just wanted to, you know, see how could I connect the two. And so from me being a part of, um, from me doing that, I was able to um, meet Lindell as well as some of the other NRO partners um, through the NAC when I went through an internship through LSAMP. And um, for summers 2016 and 2017, I did um, two NR, um, REUs with them as well as I did complete an RU and is still working on RU this year um, with the NAC. And so both of, both of my sites were at Charlottesville in Charlottesville as well as this one that I've just recently completed was at Space Telescope. 
So after all of that, after doing these um, internships, I, you know, I finished my degree with biology and education at Elizabeth City State, but I I wasn't ready to go to graduate school just yet. And through a connection through the NAC, actually, in one of my research, one of my research projects that I was doing in summer 2617, it led me to being able to get a applicant up to get um, chosen to be a research scientist at NASA Goddard as one of their postback students, because my advisor, she knew I had a very strong interest in astronomy, but I also had very strong skills in biology. So what better way to connect the two than connecting me with the astrobiology sector? So while I was there in summer 20, in all the, um, in, in the year of 2018, after I completed my degree, I was able to work at Goddard and I got a lot of skills in atmospheric modeling, specifically in paleoclim- paleoclimatology, which is looking at early earth and its evolution, as well as looking at atmospheres of exoplanets that could be comparable to that. So really cool. It was a lot of fun. But outside of that, I still wanted to pursue my education. So I eventually left Goddard after a year and I got into the atmospheric sciences at Howard University's um, master's department. And I just recently completed that degree this past summer. Um, Anja, as well as Lindell and a few of my close friends from the NAC all came. It was very supportive and they actually watched me defend. And so now fast forward to fall 2021, I just started at George Mason um, University in Fairfax, Virginia, working on my climate dynamics PhD, concentrating in paleoclimatology. So I'm hoping to get back to a lot of the atmospheric modeling and looking at the exoplanetary connections in that regard. So that's pretty much how my crazy but beautiful journey got got me to the neck. And so one of the highlights of the things that I've been able to do, like Lindell mentioned, was that I've been able to do a more in, um, to do more um, things with the NAC, such as just being able to plan the NAC meetings. That's very special to the NAC because we all, um, our cohorts, when we come together, they don't actually get to meet sometimes because we're in different locations. So the NAC meeting is like where we all get to meet. And especially the fact that we get to connect, connect with people from not just from the current cohort, but we get to meet our NAC alums. And we have a lot of different um, uh, different mentors and resources that come out to support us. Like as you can see in the picture, you see Jessica Harris. She's kind of the auntie of our group. She's very much our, she's very much the person that we like to go to and talk to. And she brings a lot of really good perspectives and really encouraging, encouraging words and how we can better ourselves as well as in just pursuing degrees. And then just, you know, like um, other people that you see up here is you see Moya and a lot of all of the students that, um, that have actually matriculated through the National Moya being one of the first ones that came through. She actually just completed her PhD. So it's just really cool to have people like that as role models because, you know, now I remember when, you know, I got there, Moya was in my position as a graduate student and now Moya's just finished and here I am start in the same position when I met her. And it's just so crazy because you get to see that evolution of everyone and just, it's just a really awesome thing. And that, you know, some like this past, um, this past meeting we had um, that this year we had different um, science talks but some of the highlights of those talks that we had was that we talked about professional development. We had very good conversations about social injustice because I don't think that in STEM we have we have that science aspect that we got to talk about, but we really never really got to talk about the other things that comes to being comes with being a scientist, especially as minorities. So this meeting was really, really, really was a really powerful meeting because not only did we talk about the science, but the parts of it that we we just, you know, those those other human aspects that we also need to learn about ourselves as we're going through this journey. So the NAC meetings are something that's very special and I'm very honored to be able to be able to continue to plan for these meetings as we as they come as they come um, along. So as for my research, one of the research projects that I've done was working with radio observations on indoor um, space weather. So essentially what we were looking at was how flare activity impacts planets. So in our case, what we were doing is we were using a template star and we were looking at using such as CN Leo or Wolf 359, however, which one you know it by. And essentially, well, we know that um, CN Leo has a lot, is a red dwarf that has a lot of flare activity. And so we were trying to see what we were trying to see. Um, basically, in my project, I was imagining how would, if they have all this magnetic activity going on from this Imdorf, how would that actually shape the evolution of planets if it has planets? So, what we were doing is that we were looking at the flare activity. And this is just sort of a way that this is basically a 
step-by-step -step thing of how I did this, of analyzing the flare activity was for one, we had observations of about, we had a total of eight observations and I was looking at the higher, higher wavelengths, um, radio wavelengths of the eight to 12 gigahertz data. And what we did is we processed all of that data through the VLA pipeline first. And then from there, we were able to image the data um, is circular polarization, whether it was right or left. And then we were able to remove all of those background sources. And then we needed to record the fluxes as well as the errors in the fluxes. And from us being able to record the plot, see all um, from us doing all of that process, and we were able to determine whether or not we were seeing possibly cyclotron maser, um, maser um, emission, which is essentially where you have like what is what is makes auroras, or whether you have gyrosynchrotron emission, which would be what you have with very, very strong flare activity, which would be very detrimental to planets. And then you also have, um, and so that was just basically how we were looking at this. So that's how we were essentially looking at the radio observations. And then these are just some images from me processing that data. So um, these are the, all the eight observations. I was able to put them into a time lapse. And so well, I'll let it come back around and then I'll explain. <laughs> so in, what you're seeing here is that um, when you look at the flare activity, you have, um, this is um, the star. And when you see that really bright flare in four and five, that is actually the flaring that's occurring on the star. And then you can see it sort of pulsates back from the from not having flares. So that's just, um, so that's just um, one part of it that we were able to see. And then this is just me, I guess, my thoughts of how I've enjoyed my time being a part of the NAC and just how it's helped me build my career. For one, it's like um, one thing that I felt was very important, as they've mentioned, is the lifelong mentorship. Um, I felt like this was a very important aspect to that has really shaped my career because um, I have, I've, over the neck, over the course of the neck, I've had three mentors and they're all very awesome. And that while it has been since 2016, which is so long ago, <laughs> They still talk to me every, we still talk on a regular basis. They ask me how I'm doing. And we just, um, and that they're always very encouraging when I need them, when I don't always feel my best, they're just always there to just ve be very much there for me. And that they've really been um, in times where I've not had that support system in certain environments that I've been in while along my STEM journey, I can always count on the knack and a lot of my mentors and other friends to be there for me. So that was something that has really shaped and encouraged and empowered me as I've gone through this journey. And that I like the fact that because of my connections with the NAC, speak, um, in which where I did my summer research, you know, from 2016 and 2017 to actually segue me into uh, um, working at NASA, which it was, it was never on my radar in my wildest dreams that I would be working at NASA at 21 years old at all. So for that, I was like, oh gosh, when I got to NASA, it was like, I have to find new goals because this was the bucket list. This was it. <laughs> so that was where. So to have to have had to have had that opportunity was just it was it was surreal. <laughs> and then also just you know working in professional development um, with the NAC. I have professional memberships with the AAS um, as well as NSBP and a few others. And it's just been really exciting to be able to connect and you know be able to encourage others as well as to be just be connected in such a way that I can better myself and to continue to do more great scientists with great sci others other great scientists and yeah just that's pretty much what really just has made my time at the NAC really awesome and that I'm ready for any questions yeah <laughs> thank you Aaliyah um I mean just thank you for this and, and thank you for all that you do uh, I think as um as you may may have heard from this um I think the NAC program is pretty powerful, but uh, I say this all the time, the real power and the strength and the uh, amazingness of this program comes from the alums themselves, from the students, and mostly from the alums who, like Azia and Aaliyah, um, come back and give back and continue to support each other and, and the younger, uh, earlier career students. So thank you. Um, if there are any questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. I, uh, but very, very informational um, about the NAC and, and, and how it um, has touched your life. I just, I was thinking this, uh, as I was hearing each one of the students' testimonials, I'm like, man, I wish I, would, I had that when I was coming through. <laughs> but, but, but that's great. I mean, that, that's how things evolve. That's how we um, 
we grow forward and and to let you know that the community we have a very uh, vast uh, scientific community of great interest and that we're here to help you proceed to the next level in your career um, likewise not only your career because you probably be helping our grandkids so <laughs> um, but nevertheless um, again thank you um, Lindell and and Anya and and uh, Faye and and uh, Azia, Azia and, and, and Kenny, right? That's sharp for Kenneth, right, Kenny? I called you Ken, so please forgive me. Uh, and okay. uh, uh, Aaliyah, uh, thank you all very much for, for just sharing your experiences, sharing the opportunities that um, NRAO has um, for uh, NS, NSBP and its members and participants and all, all those in the scientific uh, community. And just for a special note, you know, next year, yeah, I'm gonna tell y'all a secret, okay? Don't y'all tell nobody now. I'm gonna tell a secret, okay? Next year, we're going to be at NRAO in Charlottesville in person. <laughs> Super news. <laughs> and we're looking forward to it. And we're looking forward to it. Again, thank you all so very much. Um, and I think this is our program. Please, as you would see in the chat, we, we, we shared several times the uh, evaluation instrument. We acted uh, all of our participants, all of you all would, um, it's about a three, three question survey. If you would, would just do that, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, and again, thank you. And let's have a great, a great conference. We look forward to seeing all of you all at the conference. Um, and, you know, hey, let's make this year, let's make the year, this year great. And that way it'll make next year even greater. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And especially for NREO being a, a great and proud sponsor of NSVP, uh, not just for our next year, but they've been with us all the way. And we really appreciate that. And, and let's continue to partner together. Take care. And thank I'll see all. you at the conference. Okay. Bye.